Welcome to New Retina Radio Journal Club with VBS. I'm Basil Williams at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Eye Institute, and we have a wonderful panel here today uh, to speak about diversity in clinical trials. So first up, we have Karen Jang Miller at UMass Memorial Eye Center. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Absolutely. And next, we have Kat Talcott from Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Thanks, Kat, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. All right. And then last but not least, we have M. Ali Khan from Mid-Atlantic Retina in Philadelphia. Ali, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Great to be here. Oh, fantastic. So uh, the goal of uh, today is to summarize a couple of journal articles that we have, uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion as well. Uh, and so the first article we're going to talk about uh, is Expanded Clinical Spectrum of Pentosin Polysulfate Maculopathy, a Macula Society Collaborative Study. It's by Naraj Jain et al. for the Macula Society Pentosin Polysulfate Maculopathy Study uh, Group, and it was published in March of 22 in Ophthalmology Retina. So Karen, would you like to summarize this paper for us? Yes, thank you so much, Basil. So like you said, this is a multi-institutional retrospective study that explores the spectrum of clinical manifestations of pentosin polysulfate sodium maculopathy, or PPM. Pentosin, as people, as you might not know, is a commonly used medication for interstitial cystitis, which is a chronic pain syndrome of the bladder. Um, these cases from the paper were gathered by members of the Macula Society. It included the detailed typical imaging features of PPM, which included on fundus photography, macular hyperpigmented spots, yellow-orange deposits, or patchy RP atrophy, um, fundus autofluorescence showed hyper and hypo autofluorescence spots in the posterior pole, and OCT showed focal thickening or elevation of RPE with associated hyperreflectance or near infrared reflectance from imaging. The mass reviewers um, were used to confirm the diagnosis, and in total, 74 cases were included for the study. So, some key results um, the median age at diagnosis was 62 years for these people. It was a predominantly female cohort. And the median duration of exposure to pentosin polysulfate sodium was about 14 years. The median cumulative PPS exposure was 1.5 kilograms. However, four cases did report less than 0.65 kilograms cumulative exposure. The presenting symptoms are most often um, decreased or blurry vision and prolonged dark adaptation, and a minority of people had no symptoms at all. Um, some novel findings to note from this paper were that there is one case where findings were only seen on near infrared reflectance imaging. Um, and it wasn't seen on fundus photography or um, uh, uh, fundus autofluorescence, which is that suggests that um, near infrared reflectance imaging might be a very sensitive detection tool for this type of maculopathy. There was one patient with highly asymmetric disease, um, and then two patients had prominent vitelliform deposits reminiscent of patent dystrophy. And there are also higher rates of macular CNV um, and CME that were reported in this paper in comparison to other studies in the past. So the overall recommendations from this paper was that yearly monitoring is indicated um, and cessation of the medication with diagnosis of toxicity is um, encouraged. So thanks so much. That was a fantastic summary. I want to throw it over to Kat for a second. Can we get some of your reactions to this paper? Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I thought this was a really interesting study. As the author said, it's the largest series of PPM, which I think is really powerful. Um, one of the things that I was also sort of really struck by looking at this paper is that over 50% of the patients were sent in for AMD and they turned out to have something different. So it definitely um, made me think about sort of having, you know, um, like really looking at people's medication lists if some things look a, like typical. And then I think the last thing to sort of keep in mind is, you know, this is a case series of um, PPM that was sort of sent in by like retina specialists. So I think you have to keep in mind that these might tend to be like more advanced, like, um, uh, like manifestations of the disease. So, you know, I think there's some limitations to looking at a case series like this, but overall, I think really helpful information. Oh, those are some wonderful points. Thanks so much. So I think we'll move the discussion along to our next paper now, which is uh, titled Redefining the Spectrum of Pentosin Polysulfate Retinopathy, Multimodal Imaging Findings from a Cross-Sectional Screening Study. And the authors were Andrew Dew and uh, at all. And this uh, paper was accepted in March of 2022 in ophthalmology retina uh, as well. So uh, Ali, would you like to discuss this paper a little bit? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Basil. So similar to the prior paper discussed, this was a case series of patients from the University of Wisconsin uh, of patients who uh, were identified to have taken based on their EMR or had passed prior exposure to pentosin polysulfate sodium. And it was a collaborative study between the ophthalmology department and also the urology and OB-GYN departments, which I thought was a good way to do it because those are the departments that typically, uh, uh, you know, prescribe those medications for interstitial cystitis. So the patients, uh, they they were contacted and 39 overall patients were agreed to be part of the study in which they came in for, you know, medical history, color fundus photography, autofluorescence, and OCT. And the patients were divided as either having definite toxicity or questionable toxicity based on their OCT and autofluorescence findings. And overall, the mean visual acuity at baseline was actually quite good. It was 2022. And the mean uh, PPM dosage uh, was 282 milligrams. And the cumulative dose was 915 milligrams over a period of a mean 8.8 years. And they found that actually 41% of eyes had evidence of toxicity. And of those, 31% were classified as definite toxicity, and the remainder were questionable toxicity based on the reading center criteria for OCT and autofluorescence findings. And similar to the prior discussed paper, they had some uh, you know, major themes they noticed on the imaging, particularly on the SDOCT. They noticed interdigitation zone abnormalities and flying saucer defects, which might, uh, you know, be reminiscent of, say, plaquenil toxicity. And more so that 67% um, of the eyes had some abnormalities outside the central sub subfield or beyond the arcades, meaning it was not just central macular changes, but also uh, more peripheral. So their main points was that, uh, you know, this percentage, 41%, was higher than reported in prior series and were not just in the central macula and could uh, demonstrate actually uh, changes beyond the arcades. And they did consider, you know, considering a lower threshold for diagnosis of PPM and perhaps uh, screening annually at 500 milligrams of cumulative dose uh, exposure. Yeah, so that's a fantastic summary. Thanks so much. Once again, we'll uh, turn it over to Kat uh, to hear any thoughts you have on this article. Yeah, I think this was a really interesting paper as well. I really appreciated how the authors really tried to sort of clarify what image findings you can see with PPM um, and sort of come up with a more like robust way of approaching these patients. Um, and so I really appreciate that effort to sort of better clarify what is toxic and what is not. One of the questions that I had though is sort of how they defined what is toxic and they basically um, did that by if patients had findings on OCT and like autofluorescence, which I think is a little different than what we would necessarily do in practice. Like if we think about things like Plaquenil, we say that people have problems with Plaquenil if they have findings on OCT, but not necessarily if we don't have, you know, access to other tests. So I was sort of interested to hear the other people's, um, your thoughts a little bit on sort of what that definition of toxicity meant and how that applies to how we see patients. Oh, that is a fantastic question. And I think that will kind of uh, be something that we'll get into in our panel discussion just after the break. So to everyone in the audience, uh, we'll take a quick break. And then when we come back, we will start off with Kat's questions. Talk to you soon. All right, welcome back to New Retina Radio Journal Club with VBS. Once again, I'm Basil Williams. I'm here with uh, Karen Jang Miller, Catherine Talcott, and Emma Lee Khan. And so we're gonna be talking about some of the clinical relevance of the two papers we just discussed before the break. And one of the last things that we touched on, Kat asked a fantastic question about uh, how each of us kind of define uh, what toxicity is in this kind of scenario. So before I give my thoughts, I wanna give Karen an opportunity to kind of uh, say how she would define uh, toxicity in this scenario. Sure. Um, so I use multimodal imaging in order to define toxicity. Um, so I use a combination of um, the OCT, uh, the fundus autofluorescence, and I use the fundus photography for documentation moving forward to see if there are any, if I see toxicity, if there's any worsening and progression on it. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, similar to other diseases that we screen for, for maculopathy, like for example, for Plaquenil, um, using fundus, fundus autofluorescence as well as OCT in the visual field. Um, I think it's um, pretty important as um, the OCT can often look like other retinal pathologies. And so um, it's helpful to have all that, all, the whole picture with all those imaging modalities. Yeah, I agree completely. I think the only thing uh, that we do additionally is we do do an Amsler grid test for uh, a lot of our patients. That's kind of in the standard routine workup. And so uh, that may add a little bit of information 
um, but perhaps not as much uh, as some of the other imaging that you mentioned. Um, Ali, uh, you, you definitely have an opportunity to answer that as well, um, but I kind of also wanted to uh, throw it to you. We talked a little bit about um, screening uh, in these situations, and I was really interested in hearing your thoughts about uh, if you think screening is a good idea and when you would uh, initiate screening in this scenario. Yeah, so uh, I agree with Karen's comments. I think, uh, you know, as we're still learning about this disease, getting every imaging modality that you can get, especially the OCT and the autofluorescence is a good idea. And as we get more cases and experience, uh, maybe we'll have, a, you know, be able to whittle it down to, to, to one or two maybe uh, primary features. But uh, I think the screening uh, issue is important because as we're now more aware of this, I think we're going to get more referrals for people who are just starting the medication similar to Plaquenil and uh, say perhaps in an older population who maybe say have a family history of other retinal diseases, how do we really distinguish, uh, you know, early PPM versus, you know, age related changes you might find in other diseases. I think uh, with full blown PPM, I think uh, there's been pretty good identification of it, you know, compared to other retinal diseases, there is a phenotype that you can really discern. But in early stages, I don't know if we, we truly know that just yet. So I think um, as screening becomes more widespread, we'll get a better idea of, you know, the natural course uh, of this disease over time to say what to perhaps stop the disease, uh, stop the medication. You know, the problem is, is there's actually not another alternative. Uh, you know, it's the only FDA approved treatment for interstitial cystitis. And my wife happens to be a urogynecologist. So she asked me this question now, uh, what is she supposed to do? Um, and, you know, do I need to send this to a retina person right away? And I didn't really have the greatest answer for her. We just say, yeah, we just tell them to stop it, but that's easy for us to say. Um, but, um, you know, I think uh, with earlier screening, we're going to have to get experience with earlier toxicity and how to do that. Uh, I don't think it's borne out yet, but, you know, the, the second paper we discussed, and I think is, uh, you know, in line with the Macula Society paper and also, you know, recent FDA label change that if you've had a 500 milligram cumulative dose, you are supposed to be uh, screened annually. So um, I'm not the greatest at calculating doses. I don't know about you guys in your EMRs. Uh, so I'm going to leave that uh, part up to the urology and OB-GYN departments to kind of guide me. But if someone comes in, I'm just going to get an OCT and auto for us since they come back in a year. And I think, uh, you know, as we get more experience that that might change similar to, to Plaquenil. No. I mean, those are some fantastic points. So Kat, one of the things that you had mentioned um, earlier is the idea of assessing patients who are on this medication at an earlier time point. Uh, so that way we can assess, you know, if there are any findings. Do you have anything in your EMR that kind of pops up to say a patient is on this medication? I know that we don't have anything like that where I practice and I kind of brought that up as something that might be interesting, but I was curious to know your thoughts. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We actually have been working on instituting sort of a stop measure in our um, system. You know, I'm, I have the benefit of being at Cleveland Clinic, where most of our patients who see us for ophthalmology get all their medical care at the Cleveland Clinic. So we actually put in um, a stop in Epic or our, our like EMR system so that whenever this medication is ordered in general, it automatically triggers an order in the system for an OCT and a consult to ophthalmology as a whole. Um, so that hopefully moving forward, we're sort of able to start screening everyone who's put on this medication. Um, we've been sort of working on sort of making sure it's instituted in each case and sort of, um, you know, figuring out workarounds. But I think that's, I think that's where this is sort of headed towards is trying to build in, you know, if you're at a sort of a large hospital based system, is there something that can sort of help you with that? Um, I think one of the things that I've found interesting, though, over the past year is that um, actually some patients come in on their own um, because they've started to see um, commercials from lawyers um, that you can file lawsuits. So I've actually had, I think, about five patients over the past year where patients have come in on this medication being like, I need an OCT, I need autofluorescence, and I need an FA. That's what my lawyer said that I need in order to move forward. So it's interesting how these patients sort of come to you. But I think in order to really help people's, you know, vision to prevent, you know, these findings, I think we need to get them in earlier. And it just matters. It, it, it depends on think I, on what your hospital or like um, clinic system is to be able to get those patients in. Yeah, I think uh, that's pretty amazing. I think it'll definitely be really helpful for us from a clinical standpoint to have uh, our hospital systems put in some of those uh, guides. Uh, to let us know when patients are on those medications. So let's say we don't have that opportunity uh, currently. Karen, what, what are your thoughts in, in based on some of these papers and your own personal experience? What kind of things are you looking for uh, for early stage disease or what kind of things do you see that would tip you off to kind of check the medication list? 
Um, so I do what part of our hard stops for our, our I'm on Epic. And so they have us review the medications and everything. And I try to be truthful to that. So I do take a quick gander through it. Um, and so sometimes I found patients, I found patients on Pentosin like that. Um, interestingly at UMass, um, there was a big study that uh, Dr. Shulman Shaw had conducted um, where she had worked with um, some of the primary care doc doc doctors and contacted a bunch of people who had, um, uh, who are on Pentosin and they came in for screening tests. And so I actually inherited a large cohort of patients um, who have been on Pentosin and some of them who've been identified to have Pentosin maculopathy, um, which I found very interesting. But I also do echo uh, Kat's statement on how patients are very educated these days um, and they are seeing all these uh, articles and um, you know commercials about the new toxicities of Pentosin and they are coming to us. They actually had one patient who um, came, we thought she had just pattern dystrophy. And then she wrote a follow-up email saying, FYI, I was on Pentosin. Do you think I have Pentosin toxicity? So we brought her in for more testing. Um, she didn't end up having it, but it was, uh, it was an interesting, it was an interesting case that we hadn't started thinking about it. So it's also on my differential now, whenever I see, um, you know, AMD, uh, like deposits, um, you know, Drews and what I think were Drews in, um, I, I actually put in my template to ask about Pentosin usage. Oh, fantastic. So Ali, I was interested in the conversation that you were having with your wife, uh, considering her specialty. What do you think our roles are as retina providers and kind of interacting um, with the Eurogyne community uh, and kind of handling these patients? Is this something where we should be kind of actively reaching out to assess these patients on a regular basis? Should we just be kind of communicating in general? Do we, you know, how aware are they of this uh, and, and things like that. I think, uh, you know, the, the discussions I've had that the urogynecology community at the least um, is aware of it. And I think it's been brought up in their subspecialty meetings as well. But, uh, you know, it's just very abstract, like, oh, this can cause damage to the retina. There's not much, you know, action thereafter. So she, you know, was asking me, like, how quickly do they need to come in? And, you know, who can they see? Can they see their general eye doctor? Or do they have to see a retina specialist? So um, I think eventually it will will have to be uh, similar to Plaquenil, where maybe comprehensive ophthalmology takes a look first and then can be referred to retina if there's sort of a question thereafter. But, um, you know, I told her, look, it's not an emergent, um, you know, evaluation, certainly, you know, a routine type of visit, but uh, I think we could probably give them a better picture of, of what this really looks like and what the actual visual consequences can be. And I think hopefully that'll start, uh, you know, a dialogue similar to what we might have with rheumatology and, and, and Plaquenil. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think uh, when I have these patients come into my clinic, you know, saying that they're on this medication and they heard about it, um, I do try and reach out uh, to their physician just to let them know that they came in asking about it, uh, just to kind of open the doors of communication as well, see if there's anything additional that we could uh, be talking about. So if you see uh, somebody on this medication, Kat, um, and you see just kind of a small uh, deposit kind of a teleform like lesion. Is that something that's going to uh, push you to stop the medication or uh, would you evaluate a little bit more, continue to watch? How would you approach that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think the Macula Society, you know, paper brought up some interesting points that you can sort of see those sort of atypical findings in some patients. You know, normally with my sort of, you know, in general, intermediate AMD, you know, patients, my follow up is sort of Q6 months. So if it's just a vitelliform lesion, and I don't really see a lot of other findings concerning for it, I might at that visit be more likely to get sort of supplemental imaging. So to get like an autofluorescence. Um, but if it's just a vitelliform like lesion, and my suspicion, you know, for PPM isn't that high, I might just continue to watch them for like another visit, maybe see them back in like three and six months to see if there's any progression on the imaging. You know, if they've been on um, like the medication for a very long time, or, you know, um, they have, you know, another retina problem or their vision is compromised in some other way, then it might have a lower threshold for just recommending stopping right away. But if it's just of a teleform lesion, I think at present, I'd probably, you know, watch closely instead of just stopping at the initial visit. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. So um, thank you all for uh, a, such a wonderful discussion. Uh, we'd like to thank the audience for listening to New Retina Radio Journal Club with VBS. And we'd like to invite you to stay tuned for further episodes. Thank you all. Take care.